There we are. Couple, couple, We're bro. here. We're live. Yeah. We're live. Mr. S. What's going on, everybody? Uh, it's Adam Henkel from the Makers Mob, a.k.a. the cameraman more recently. Uh, <laughs> and the Samurai Carp Carpenter and John Peters. So say hi, guys. What's up, everybody? Hey, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, we are going to just kind of wait a little bit here, but we're going to have, uh, we're going to do a live Q and a after we get an update from both Jesse and John, uh, kind of what, see what they've got, uh, going on these days, what's coming up. And then, um, I know John, John has a couple questions for Jesse, just about the off grid project that, uh, that we got going on up there. Um, so if you guys, what is this? Adam, Jesse, and John, the boy band formerly known as AJS. <laughs> All right, all right. Um, if you guys got questions, hold those for a little bit until we kind of get the update. But um, I want to start with, I mean, I've been with Jesse quite a bit lately, so I want to start with John. <laughs> we need some space. I need some space. We're not doing the in, the same, in the same building. <laughs> yeah. I want to I want to get an update from John. John, what, what have you been up to? I heard some rumors about some roofing yeah. stuff. And, and what, what are you doing lately? The roofing project was a project that I did with a, a company and it's uh it's just something that I'm doing with, with Instagram to get a, uh, it was just part of like a YouTube Instagram deal to get a little bit of a break on the roofing. So that's kind of an obligation that I'm fulfilling right now, Nice. but I didn't work on it. I've done roofing. I've done roofing enough to know that I don't want to do roofing. Oh, it's not fun. I did a stint of roofing when I got out of high school. And after like six months, I was like, I got to figure something else. I got to figure out how to use this brain of mine because I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. It's good. It's good to feel that pain when you're young to like rip a roof in August because oh, yeah. you can sort of, you can sort of gauge other things in life against that. Like, well, I'm not ripping a roof or ripping insulation out of an attic in the middle of the summer. So it yeah. can't be that bad. Yeah. So what else have you, what have you, what else you got uh, going on in the shop, John, anything it, coming up that's exciting? Well, I'm working on a little shaker bench right now. I like shaker furniture mm -hmm. and um, I'm probably going to go into dive a little bit deeper into shaker. Shaker has a nice uh, kind of mix with modern. I think that shaker can go with modern. Yeah. So, uh, I'll probably just kind of go down that rabbit hole for a couple of weeks and see what happens. And um, I was just up in Vermont looking at, did you ever hear of uh, Shackleton? Shackleton, Ernest Shackleton. I think he was like an yeah, explorer. explorer that went down to South Pole or whatever. And yeah. Well, his, his family, his family has a, uh, a furniture business in uh, Woodstock, Vermont. And I was just visiting that yesterday just got back last night and uh really beautiful furniture and very inspiring to to see some great craftsmen you know see their work and talk to them about what they use for finish and things like that it's the one thing i i i don't like about being on the west coast is we just don't have history as much history over here and so it's like there's so much woodworking history on the East Coast where I'm just like, oh, man, there's all these timber framers and all these historical sites where you can go and see all the stuff. And, you know, people that are, you know, so many woodworkers that are still working and have great businesses and stuff. And it's like over here, it's like, yeah, there's some like kind of trendy modern stuff. But like there's no like there's not a lot of people doing craftsmanship anymore on the West Coast. So it's like I hear about all the events and the you know, meetups and maker gatherings, they all happen on the East Coast. I'm just like, damn it. That's the thing. That's the thing. When you're far away, it's it's hard to say, okay, I'm going to travel across the country. Uh, recently, I went up and saw Jimmy DeResta's, uh, real close to Jimmy's place up at Maker's Camp. Yeah. yeah. A lot of great people up there, really a lot of talented people. That was one of the first events. I, I've only gone to two events. I went to... Um, Workbench Con about two years ago before everything hit the fan. Yeah, you, you took your son up to this one recently. Yeah, right? you know it's funny. I'm I'm watching Jesse and I'm watching your kids. They're young and they're not. You know, I, I watched you and your wife haul that big water tank <laughs> up that hill. 
and it's not going to be long. It'll be your boys because it's amazing the difference between like eight and 14. All of a sudden, they just get bigger and stronger. And like my kids, I taught them all how to surf and skateboard. Now they're all, they just blow me out of the water. I mean, they're 24, 21, and 20. Yeah. So that's what you expect. But yeah, we've got uh, 10 boys between the three of us. He's <laughs> Jesse's got four, right? You've got three. I got three, and I have a girl. There's I can't. Hope. You have a girl. girl, guys. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gotta be careful. Yeah. Um. So Jesse, what's uh? I mean, I know what's going on with you, but uh, give an update on what what you're up to lately for people who are watching. Well, I just put a coat of uh, Odie's oil on my uh, little folding tabletop, which is honestly the most beautiful piece of wood I've ever handled. Um, I got this uh, quilted burl maple slab off Facebook Marketplace several years ago. This guy that was going to make some tables out of it ended up moving. And he's like, I can't take it with me. And so he offloaded. I got it for 300 bucks. It's like a 10 foot long, two inch thick, wow. you know, 28 inch wide, like gorgeous burl with quilting. It's just absolutely phenomenal. So I cut a section off of that to make my little folding uh, table that it's going to go in the little uh, shed up at the property there. And then I'm going to start on making just like a little, a little folding leg that'll kind of come out. So it's going to be on a piano hinge kind of against the wall and then it'll fold up and it's all like live edge with like the quilted bark and everything. Like it just looks so beautiful. So I was just oiling that up and giving it a buff. I sanded it to like 400 grit. It just feels like glass. So I'm, um, Pretty excited to like get that that installed uh, in the next coming weeks because um, that'll be like probably one of the little focal points of the cabin when you walk in. You just can't help but like see this piece of wood with kind of like gnarly edges and everything sitting against the wall. And so that's that's what I'm working on today. And then we're uh, planning on going up to the to the lake to Hartwood. That's what I've named the property. Um, and uh so yeah we'll go up there and try and get the little wood stove in so i got a little cubic mini wood stove that just arrived and it's literally like a foot square and the wood has to be like six and three quarter inches long like little scraps to make a fire in it it's so small but it'll be perfect for you know just a little 10 by 10 cabin because if you put a big wood stove in there you'd just be cooking yourself out right you so so yeah we're gonna try and get that in and we got um uh, two of my nephews coming up, one Adam's boys, and then my brother-in-law, Wade, uh, he's a plumber. He's coming up with his son. And so we're going to try and teach those boys how to split some firewood and, uh, <laughs> you know, do something other than play video games. So, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was watching you make a fire yesterday or well, last night I was watching the video of, uh, installing the windows and you, you were saying the best way to make a fire is with those little pieces of wood, which is true. But if you want to cheat, you could use a um, a door flame log. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and if you want to be cheap, like I am, you can use a half a door flame log. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, it's amazing. We uh, we had some tree work. I had a lot of property. I had 110 acres up in Vermont. I sold most of it along with the house, and I kept 20 acres. And I'm gonna do something hopefully in about two years. But we had a bunch of tree work done. And I had a lot of limbs and everything, just how to get rid of everything. And so we had a couple of big fires. And it's amazing just how much material you can turn into nothing with a good fire. Oh, yeah, it's insane. Watching that solid turn into a gas. Like we, it took like three days to burn up that stump that we were up there. And we were like piling wood on it nice. like over and over again because it was like, you know, this big around trying to burn through that log. But finally, we we made it all of the dust and now we got a, a bit of a spot there that we're going to clear and I'm going to move the tent platform over beside the, the little shed there so it's closer to the shed and not blocking the, the view so much from the, from the property. And then we'll kind of take down the whole outdoor kitchen area because it's, you know, the tarp is shot and everything anyways. So try and move that over to the, to a little porch that we're going to build around the, around the shed and make a little fire pit up on the rock knoll there. So pretty excited to go up there for the next, um, I don't know, probably till like Wednesday next week. I'm just going to have to see how much I can get done. And I got a timber order that I'm picking up for, for the front porch, all yellow cedar and, 
And so, yeah, once we have a little porch with some steps to get up into the cabin, it'll really start feeling like a, you know, a finished space. So looking forward to that because it's just getting colder and wetter. As the, well, as the so that brings me to two questions. One is, is the cabin built out of yellow cedar? Um, no, the most of the frame, is, the timber frame is, is old growth fir. Okay. Uh, Douglas I fir. And then I got, there's some red, some of the beams are red cedar, the bigger beams. I just had like a bunch of stuff right up and that I've been swirling away. Um, so yeah, most of it's Douglas fir and then some of the, the beams are, are red cedar. And then, um, yeah, like everything else, like all the decking, same as all the boardwalks and everything that'll be like, you know, deck and, and area that's going to get hit by the rain will all be yellow cedar because that lasts so much. It's also called cypress. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's actually technically cypress, um, but we call it like Alaskan yellow cedar or yellow cedar here. Um, but it lasts for like 50 years, like old growth, good stuff. So, you know, you don't, you don't need to put a finish on it. It'll last, it'll still last the same amount whether you finish it or not. It's just an appearance thing. So I'm willing to just let it go gray so that I'm not spending my whole life refinishing wood at the property. <laughs> you know, I won't actually enjoy it. So I'll let the outside just be, a, you know, the weathered look. And then the inside is where I'll hopefully be able to show off more of the beautiful craftsmanship and wood colors and grains and stuff like that. So, And then, and then I had another question about the insulation. I saw the styrofoam that's going to go in the ceiling. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe you don't want to talk about it yet, but how are you, how, how's that going to get installed into the ceiling? How does that so, stay there? So, um, you know, I put the, the timber frame rafters are there. And then I put the boards on top, the soffit or whatever, uh, the ceiling. Um, and then on top of that, we, we put a pressure treated, uh, like eight inch rim joist all the way around the roof. And then or we first we put a membrane down. I tore off all the old tar paper because I didn't have it overlap properly and it wasn't keeping the water out. So we, we ripped that off and uh, you'll see this in the next video. Um, but we, we put a proper membrane down and taped all the seams and everything and did like full overlaps. And then we put a eight inch two by around the edge. And then I set all the eight inch styrofoam inside that. Okay. And we're strapping it over with one by fours and then I got 10 inch construction screws that are going to go through that and through the styrofoam into the the timber frame rafters underneath to kind of really hold it all down and then I'll put the fascia around the the edges to cap off the pressure cover the pressure treated and and then the one by four then we're just we're I'm doing a metal roof on top so then we actually put another membrane on top of the styrofoam so there's like multiple layers and I, you know, sick of flexed all the joints of the styrofoam, big four by eight sheets of styrofoam. So, it, you know, it's sealed like three different times already, you know, to keep the water up. And then we're putting a metal roof on top of it and I'll have a little vent strip. So air can kind of get up in between the one by fours and vent out any heat and stuff like that. So should be a pretty bomb proof uh, roof. And then um, similar solution on the walls, but we'll just be, putting three inch rigid foam against the, all the shiplap siding and around the windows. And then I'm going to strap that with one by four as well and screw through it into the, into the framing inside. And then we'll just do cedar, cedar shake, um, all, all up the one by four. So, and then, you know, that stuff breathes pretty well because it's got all the little air gaps in between the shingles. So the air will be able to travel up and behind and keep it all dry. And so having the rigid foam, you know, eliminates your need for a vapor barrier because it is a vapor barrier in itself. We'll just, you know, sicaflex all the joints and tape them with tuck tape and, and it'll, you know, be like an unbroken layer of insulation. So it's actually a lot more efficient than stick framing because of stick framing, you have all the thermal bridging of your studs, right? And the insulation is in between your studs, whereas this will, you know, all the framing is inside the cabin and then the foam wraps the whole thing around with no... Mm very minimal thermal bridging. So you get actually a lot better R value that way. And so we're using three inch foam, which is R value of five per inch. So the walls will be R15, but you know, better than a standard R15, like you would have in a stick frame. And then the roof is eight inches thick, but it's R4 because it's, it's a different type of styrofoam. So it's like R32 on the roof. So for a little 10 by 10 cabin, it's, yeah. it's going to be plenty cozy. <laughs> Yeah, sure. It won't have to go through a lot of, you know, wood stoking that little fireplace. It'll hopefully, you know, stoke it at night and it should still be warm in the morning. So it'd be fun to test that out and see how, how long it takes for the cabin to cool off. I'm sure it's going to, I'm sure it's going to hold the heat 
pretty well. Yeah. Um, just Once to we touch have in the windows, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> to touch on the, uh, the the cabin, the size of the cabin. Uh, I mean, people are always asking, and and in the video that's coming out today, it's going to get launched as soon as we're done here. Um, you talk about it a bit, but ten by ten. Why is it a ten by ten? You've answered this ten times, but there's always yeah. So our building code here, which I think is similar in North America, is you don't need a permit for anything 10 by 10 or smaller. Um, and so I was like, I don't think I'm actually gonna even bother with permits. <laughs> I'm still kind of on the fence about it because you're so you're out in the middle of nowhere and, and all the other, even the, the inspector would have to put a boat in the water to come out, <laughs> you know, anyways. And so the neighbors did it all with permits and everything like that. And so I, I still am like a little bit concerned, like, oh, if I start building without a permit, is anybody going to care or are they going to come out and shut me down? I don't actually know. Um, so I just wanted to start off by like building a little shed cabin and not have any hassle, you know, about having to jump through all the hoops in the permitting process. Cause in Canada, it's really, it's really bad. Like, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're a much more socialist co country or America's catching up pretty quick, but <laughs> not to get political, but anyways, it's like, uh, you know, so there's a lot of hoops that you got to jump through and so many, you know, things. And if you want to do anything that hasn't been done before, it's like, oh God, you got to hire architects and engineers and say that it's okay, you know, just because it's like, they look at a mortise and tenant joint and they go, oh my God, what is that? And you know, it's like, we're, we, we can't pass that. You gotta get an engineer and structural engineers and geotechs and man, you know, it's just like, God help me. Like, can I just build a shed? And so, so that's what yeah, I'm, I got you. I totally that's got what I'm doing that. And then, um, um, you know, we'll see how, how that, you know, if anybody shows up, it, it's basically <laughs> always based off a complaint basis. So, you know. How are the, your neighbors? Yeah, the neighbors are great. That's, oh, that's the problem. But then there's all sorts of other people on the lake that are driving by in boats all the time. You never know if any of them are pissed off and they're going to report you, right? So, so that's the main thing is like, I think as long as I kind of keep it small scale and I'm not, you know, building some big monstrosity out there, which I'm not planning on doing, then I shouldn't hopefully raise any red flags to people and I can just actually enjoy myself and build the way I want and the way I know is going to be structurally sound and not have to like, you know, do all the bureaucratic BS of going through the permitting process. So we'll see. I'm a bit of a maverick and I might just, I might just see if I can get away with it. And uh, if so, I, I think that would make my journey a lot more enjoyable. But if somebody, you know, blows a horn on me, then I'm going to be in a shitload of trouble and have to like go through all the hoops and fix shit. So. Hey, it'll make, it'll make for good content. It'll make for good content. <laughs> That's the great thing. I mean, it's the whole proof of concept. It's funny because I have a, I have 20 acres. We were just up there looking at the property. Yes. Uh, Wednesday, we were looking at the property and my son, Walter, who was at makers camp with me, he's going to school for film and he also likes to work and, and build things. So we might, there's two things we may do is I might buy a prefab and then just finish the inside because I don't want to do the roofing and the siding and all that. I just want to do like the built-ins and the trim and um, build the kitchen, things like that. But we might just go and build a small cabin as a proof of concept to see if like, okay, is there going to be enough interest in this? Can we get some sponsors on board to sort of <laughs> offset it? And uh, so I like the idea of kind of, kind of testing the water first, like, like what you're doing with a 10 by 10 Yeah, makes, makes a lot of sense. Will that lake freeze over? No, it doesn't freeze. So thankfully, we're on Vancouver Island, which is like Canada's Hawaii. Um, <laughs> but not to, not to say it doesn't get cold. It definitely gets cold. But um, yeah, we don't have, we don't have the crazy winters that people expect from from Canadian people um, over on the west coast here. So yeah, and the the lake is actually it gets so there's so much water coming into that lake that it's all, it's like a, a moving lake. And so the water actually like re replaces itself four times throughout the year. That's why it's so crystal clear. Like you can see down like 50 feet right to the bottom and it's just crystal clear. People drink the water right out of the lake cause it's so it comes right off the mountains and the snow melt and, and there's very little pollution over here. So, um, 
that's you know one of the main you know favorable things about the property is like it doesn't freeze over like if it you know if it, it might get a little bit of ice but nothing that would like prevent you from getting a boat in like along the edges you know in december and january february i'm sure there's like a little skim of ice here and there but it, it always gets rained out we never have snow for more than like a week or two if, if we get a dump of snow it sticks around for maybe a couple of days and then it turns to rain and washes all all away so we're a lot more wet out here that's that's we're it's kind of like a temperate rainforest on the near the west coast of Vancouver Island. So we get a ton of rain. Like I think it's like close to fifteen hundred millimeters of rain. So that's I don't know how many inches that is, but Lots. it's a lot. Um, so so yeah, that's the main thing that you got to prepare for is just soggy, foggy, cold, damp, you know, humid winter. But it's not icy or or frozen over. So. How about fishing? How is it? I I haven't even had a time chance to do it, but you'll see in the next video uh, we got some cool clips. There was actually uh, this sockeye sea run sockeye come up come up the inlet from the ocean and into the river, and they actually go through the lake to get to the river mouths where they spawn. And there was uh, what a, about a half dozen or so mm -hmm. sockeye actually. I think they were spawning right on the off the beach, like ten feet off the shore. And they were just hanging out there, these big, beautiful red salmon. And so we got some, some footage of that that we'll share share in the next video. And so it's pretty cool that way. To you. So you, there's a cutthroat, rainbow trout. I think there's some carp as well, which is a bit of an invasive species. But the fishing's pretty good there in the in the early spring. In the summertime, there's a lot of boat traffic, so the fish go a lot deeper and they, they don't bite as much in the summertime. But uh, yeah, winter time and early spring. I think there's actually some pretty really good trout fishing. You're not allowed to uh, to keep any of the sockeye. They're, they're kind of like protected, but I think you can catch and release them. I'm not sure, but uh, hmm. it's a massive lake. So I'm hoping that once I've got a little bit of infrastructure and I can actually sit down and enjoy myself. Well, not that I don't enjoy myself when I'm building, but actually just have some recreation and not be on a project all summer. Always, uh, you know, I really do want to get out there and teach my boys how to fish. And, learn how to fish myself <laughs> well that's um it it reminds me of do you, have you ever, ever watched the show meat eater i think i've heard of it but no I so he, he's a really well-known hunter steve steve aaron i think or Erwin, maybe mm -hmm. anyway he has a small cabin in alaska and it kind of reminds me of like like what you have yeah but just where it's situated near the shore and everything and just a great place to go to get away and mm. you know I'm sure you don't have great Wi-Fi out there. No. Well, I actually get a little bit of cell service because there's a tower kind of on the other side of the lake near the highway. Um, and so I, in certain spots on the property, I can get like two bars and be able to text my wife and, and even FaceTime a little bit. It's a little shoddy, but uh, I, I like the fact that there's, you know, yeah. there isn't that, you know, you just put your phone in your pocket. You only use it if you absolutely need to and, and you just soak in the unfiltered majesty i call it <laughs> you know yeah. it's just like when you're out there and there, you know there's only a couple other cabins that you can see across the lake there's maybe two little spots where there's a few other cabins and it's just untouched and and beautiful and so you can't help but just kind of go you know and you guys everybody's seen a lot of the scenery and goes man that's amazing it's even more amazing in person like you're just like you can't help but just stop and go for like half an hour, you'll just sit there and be like, look at this weather, look at all the, you know, it's so beautiful watching it all just kind of pass you by. So that's like, uh, yeah, it's a very, it's becoming a more and more special place every time I go out there. It's just like, it nourishes my soul. So I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of like, honey, let's get this cabin built and sell our Victoria house and just move out there like <laughs> the life that I want. And it's so much better than what's going on in the suburbs right now. So. We'll see. We'll see what happens the next few years. Um, I'm going to jump in here and just pr uh, prompt whoever has a, a question for either John or uh, Jesse. Uh, you can start throwing those in the chat. If you already put them in there, I'm not going to scroll back through all these comments. So just put in there like who it's for and then put in your question and we'll start doing some Q&A here uh, in just a second. John, I wanted to ask you, uh, you seem to be like the projects that you love to build, like sofa tables and entry tables and all these things. Do you have a lot of those around your house? Uh, or are these for clients? 
The last one was for a client. Okay. The the walnut one was for a client. Uh, when's the other entry table? Was it like a? Well, a, I mean, back you've 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 done. Yeah. Um, well, the Nakashima table. Obviously. Yeah, that was for a client. That too. was for a client as well. Yeah, yeah. So funny. He said, um, he goes, I found this really nice Nakashima table. It's sixty thousand dollars. Can you make me one? Yeah. <laughs> and when I told <laughs> when I told the price that I would charge him, he's like, Is that? Can you give me a better deal? I was like, What are you kidding me? Yeah. You know, I was like, forget it. But um, I'll go live for fifty. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I don't I don't give people breaks on on furniture prices. They're getting enough of a break totally you shouldn't give them a break no, that's why i don't build furniture for people because i don't grind to me on prices and i'm just like you know what screw it i'm just gonna build my own furniture i'll just keep all this stuff i'm sure i can make some money but i don't i can't stand all the haggling and back and forth people do yeah. i've got some great clients over here that's really the only he was kind of kidding me because he's a friend yeah but most of the clients so I was up at this, uh, we were looking at furniture and, you know, dining tables, $16,000, uh, coffee tables, 7,500. And at those numbers, you can make some money. Mm -hmm. And so when I work with clients, I just say, you know, this is what it is. And this is kind of like a bedroom community of Manhattan. So a lot of people here are working on wall street and taking the boat into New York city. So they're used to seeing higher numbers and, and they'll pay, but I generally only build for people who, who get it yeah. and, uh, and who will pay for it. Mm -hmm. And if I want to build it, so that's the beauty of YouTube. And if I can't, if I can't find a client, then I've got my oldest guy moved out. So now he wants a bunch of furniture. So I could always build him something. Yeah. And I could usually find somebody who wants to be attached to it. And, um, so it's nice. I mean, that's the beauty of, of, of YouTube really. Being able to make something you're proud of and then share it with every show it to everybody. That's what you want to do, right? You want to make something you like and then show it to people. Mm -hmm. Um, Jesse, we've got a question here for you. Uh actually a couple here. Uh when are you moving the boardwalk? Um as soon as I possibly can. Uh, it seems like every time I go out there, I'm like, oh, I gotta focus on the cabin because the weather's only getting worse and colder up there. And so I'm like, I want to get this thing buttoned up and, and be done with it. Um, but at the same time, like I need some bodies up there to be able to do it. Um, you know, this weekend I don't think it would work because there's only three of us and two young teenage boys or whatever. So, um, but uh, yeah, I'll probably need like five or six guys. The neighbors said that they would probably be willing to like come over and, and hoist it over. So we'll see what the water level's like when we go out there um we were thinking we might be able to just jack it up the front i'm going to pound out the dowels because i've actually like put 12 inch grk bolts through the deck or the framing of the boardwalk down into the the support beam and then i covered that with with handrail posts and sick of flex them on there so i'm like oh, i do not want to try and rip those off and take that apart so i was thinking that we would just jack up the front of the boardwalk like i'd pound out the dowels and, and leave the posts and leave the beam like attached to the boardwalk and try and just lift that up with some farm jacks and then uh, skid the whole thing on a couple of like big six by sixes. The neighbors got a whole bunch of timber piles that they said that we could probably use to make some like a little skid deck or something like that. And, and maybe put it on some casters or just grease them or something like that and just try and shove the thing over. And the neighbors could probably even bring over their little mini excavator and we could maybe attach it a strap to it and haul it over kind of a thing. So it'll be a little bit of a, a thing, or I was thinking we could lower it down onto the front of the skiff. If, if the water level is high enough, cause the skiff is like right up at the boardwalk now and, uh, and maybe like float it, hold the front front end and, you know, shove the back end over onto the little concrete wall that I built. That should be part should be pretty easy. It's just getting that front end cause it's hanging out over the water now. And the piers are like almost completely underwater. And so I need to be able to lift that up, take the posts off of the current uh, foundations that they're on, cut one of the posts down because they're going to be the same length now for the, and then, you know, drill that out, get that whole thing moved over onto the piers and then skid the boardwalk over and drop it back down onto those moors and tenant joints. So it's going to be a little bit of a logistical challenge, but it'll make for great content. And, uh, you know, worst case scenario, we'll have a floating boardwalk and <laughs> have to try and haul that thing out of the water. I don't know. 
but uh, <laughs> I'm probably screw, unscrew most of the decking just to kind of reduce <clears throat> some of the weight and and then you know four or five guys and a boat and a um, a couple slings and a mini excavator. We will make it happen. Sounds so. like like fun. <laughs> I'd like to get it done before uh, before Christmas for sure because I'm still waiting on materials for the for the ramp. My fabricators have told me that they still don't know when it's coming because um, we ordered a bunch of three by three aluminum and we're going to weld up a thirty foot ramp and and bring that up on a trailer and and haul it out there with the boat and attach it to the boardwalk down and have a ramp to the dock finally. So. It's definitely uh, high on the priority list, but it, I'm not in a rush to move the boardwalk until I know that the ramp is like ready to go, kind of a thing, right? And then I then I'll have a actual dock with a landing place and and not have to be you know tying my boats to shore and all that nonsense. But mm -hmm. it's an adventure, man. I'm I'm loving it, but I am looking forward to having a, a stationary dock and a ramp to get prop stuff up onto the property. So that'll that'll, that'll be, be nice, nice. John. John. What is your favorite word? Classic wood? question. Uh, um, are we going to, uh, are you getting a weird thing with the audio or no? I did for a second. Okay, it's better. It's All fine. right. Yeah. My, my favorite wood? Um, favorite wood to work with. Oh, I always like cherry is nice. Uh, um, cherry, walnut, sapili. Good, good choices. That's kind of your three, isn't it, Jesse? That's probably my top three as well. Yeah. I just, just started using Sapili for uh, my rocking chair and a few little other projects, and I love Sapili. That stuff's nice, and it's actually pretty affordable here, so um, I like that. Walnut's not even affordable. I haven't used walnut in years. Um, but, yeah, cherry is another, another go-to. So, uh, Question for all. Getting started in furniture and doing gaming tables in Australia, any tips for a guy just starting out? John, what do you think? Gaming tables, like, uh, like, uh, what's a gaming table? Like board games, right? Probably it's board games. Poker table, but it's for like gaming, I think. Uh, uh, well, round, I guess, just a round table. Does that make sense? Yeah, probably. They're, sometimes they're round or like a, you know, oblong or whatever. Um, I think his I question think is more like, like, as a but, furniture maker starting out, like. Okay, well, I think a great tool to get if you're going to make some tables is a biscuit joiner. I like biscuit joiners. I mean, a couple of tools you need is a table saw, a biscuit joiner. I don't or really dom think you... or domino. A domino is great if you want to bite the bullet. I just got one about a year ago. I love it. Wow! Congratulations. It's amazing. You have to sell your liver. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, there, there's so many design possibilities though. Like, and I haven't really put it to use that much yet. Yeah, they're pretty so, versatile. It's nice though. I mean, the idea of making a chair or something is just so much easier with the idea of having a domino. Yeah. Yeah, Jesse. Any tips for furniture maker just starting out? I mean, my my advice to everybody just starting out is don't go crazy and buy a ton of stuff and put yourself into debt. Um, just buy tools as you need them. So you know, set out on a project, and then if you run into a roadblock and you go, "Man, I really need a table saw," then go and get yourself a table saw, and then try and finish that project. And if you're like, "I can't finish the project without a bandsaw," then you go and find a bandsaw. But don't you know? spend tons of money on all sorts of different tools. Cause a lot of times you'll realize like there's several shop tools that I don't even use. Um, other woodworkers <laughs> might use them a lot, but I'm like, I, I have no use for those in my shop because it's just not my style. So, so when you're just starting out, you don't really know your style. You don't really know your work, you know, progression and how you, you know, want to do things or how things work in your space. You know, you kind of just have to like evolve and let your tool collection evolve with you. And so, you know, my my advice is always just buy the tool only when you absolutely need it. Because I've I've seen stuff in the store on sale and be like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to buy it and thinking I'd use it. And then it literally sits in a box for like five years. And I'm like, why the hell would I spend 400 bucks on that, you know, stupid, you know, tool or whatever. And then I end up offloading it or giving it away. Right. So, yeah, don't don't waste your money up front and just, you know evolve let your tool collection evolve with you um got a couple different questions here about like workshops and things like that both jesse and john have uh their own kind of things going on on the on their websites so you can feel free to find stuff on the websites we also have the makers mob where each of them and uh other makers have tutorials and and project plans available there there's a link for that in the description wherever you're watching there's a link in the description where you can can check out Maker's Mob uh, and learn 
bunch of different projects um, from each of these guys. So uh, feel free for that. Do you have anything, John, coming up as far as classes or anything like that, like that you're doing or? Um, not really. Uh, I kind of, I spent most of this year sort of working on the <clears throat> shop. I could, it started like in October of last year. I took down a back wall and gained six more feet in the sh back of the shop. And then I had a, a 10 by 30 foot like shed attached to the barn. And uh, you were talking about not having to vent the roof. So I, I used the spray foam insulation uh, there. Anyway, so for the last year, I've been building a few pieces of furniture, but I've really been just trying to make the most out of this small barn, which is mm. Uh, it's like 16 by 32 is the size of the barn. Then you have that little area. Then I'm upstairs right now in the, this is like the artist studio office kind of space. Um, but I'm hoping to kind of wrap it all up. I want to build a, uh, an assembly table. Cause right now I, I have a really bad practice of assembling pieces of furniture on my outfit table. Mm. So you're sort of like, you're getting pretty far in a project and then you realize you didn't rip that piece of plywood and then you got to move it off the table or put it on the side or something. So that's the, that's like my next kind of shop project. And then the plan is to really just focus on furniture and only build about eight to nine, maybe 10 pieces of furniture a year. And uh, cause those seem to do pretty well, like on YouTube, my last, the entrance table for me, it's at like 55 or 56,000 views and it's kind of steady. And it's just a 38 minute long video. And so that's, that's good for me. I like that. Mm -hmm. I've built something that I, I like what I don't like to do. I don't want to make something for the sake of making something to create content. So I want to have a piece of furniture that has some value 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that's, that's really going to be the direction of the channel. And that's going to be the direction of the channel until if, until, and if I do something with my sons and we, we do this house project. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting. Cause I mean, Jesse, Jesse kind of operates the same way. He doesn't really want to do anything just for the sake of creating content. No, uh, I can't stand that. It drives me crazy for some <laughs> So, I mean, very... it, has, it has to have a practical, at least a practical function in my own life or someone else's life. If I'm giving it away or selling it or something like that, just like, you know, to see something trending and people are like, are you going to do this? Everybody's doing it. And I'm like, I have no use for that because I don't, you know, I'm not into gaming or I'm not into this, you know, and it's just like, so, you know, people, you know, it, to watch all the trends and watch like people get crazy views on stuff that, you know, I could probably simply make, but I'm just like, that's just not me. And so got to try to stay true to myself. That's the one thing that I've learned being on YouTube is if you don't stay true to yourself, you start to lose your mind really quickly. Um, so, so yeah, like I'm just like, you got to have your, you know, your boundaries and, and stick within them. But, uh, um, buddy over here, Rafael is asking me about that little Japanese style, timber frame house so yes i am planning on building um my own little home but it'll be like more of a cottage on the the lake property hardwood um so you know i'm finishing up my little bunky shed cabin that i can stay in and then i'm going to start on uh you know modeling up and designing uh a little family cabin there so it's not going to be super big um because i'm trying to become more of a minimalist in my life after uh, acquiring a lot of stuff and and things over the last several years, I've realized that does not bring very much happiness into my life. It just brings a lot of stress and debt. And so I'm trying to now move in a different direction of, of becoming more minimalistic in my needs and desires in life because I'm finding 10 times more joy just sitting in front of a fire out in the woods than I am, you know, having all the tools and, and toys and bells and whistles in my shop and, you know, having to pay through the nose for all of it kind of stuff so that yeah you know it was something that i thought when i started out would would bring me happiness to have a shop and have a really nice house and to have all the things in a truck and blah 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 and all the toys and and then i got a bunch of them mainly by going into debt and realized like <laughs> this is actually not fun at all it's just a lot of maintenance and a lot of work and i'm not even really enjoying what i have and uh i'm actually a lot happier with less so i'm trying to just downsize as much as possible 
And, um, you know, if it makes sense for our family to move up to the lake property and live off grid in a few years, then we might actually try that. And we're, we're seriously thinking about it, but we're obviously not rushing into anything right now. And so, so yeah, you know, I plan on making some furniture and stuff throughout the winter and, and, you know, practical pieces that I'm going to use up at the property. And, and, uh, I'm actually, once I model up the, the, the cabin that I'm going to build, I want to build like a life, like not a life size, but like a scale model, you know, out of like little pieces of wood and just like have an actual visual, you know, 3d model of the timber frame and be able to like see it, you know, at a small scale. I think that'd be fun to do over the winter time. And then maybe next spring we can start pouring some footings and getting to, you know, slaying some timber and building it, but we'll see that, that that's a probably like the best case scenario. I'm, I don't even know if I'll start building that next spring or summer, but, um, we'll see. We'll see how things go with finances and whether or not I can afford to buy timber because I'm buying it all as I go. I'm not going into debt. I'm not taking on any more debt. So it's all kind of on a cash flow basis. So if we can afford to invest in some timber to start building, then we will. And if not, I'll just kind of keep working on infrastructure and, you know, water systems and trails and, you know, making the property more usable um, so that we can really enjoy it, you know, next mm -hmm. spring and summer. Uh, John, we got a question for you here. Uh, we're always so organized. I no mess in the shop or were you always, sorry, so organized uh, or did you get better over the years? I got better over the years. And if you go to like my first videos, you'll see the shop's a disaster. And so the, most of the, most of my income 10 and 12 years ago was coming from original artwork and making frames, picture frames. So I would charge for picture frames between 750 and 1250 a linear inch. So if you're making a, a picture frame that's 50 inches square, it's a decent amount of money. And I was doing most, most of the frames for clients for around here and in New York City, but I was just working all the time, just making frames. And if you see the shop, it's just, you know, so basically the tools I was using was a drum sander uh, Williams and Hussey molding planer, a, um, my table saw and my pin nailers. Hmm. And, um, but you know, I was, wasn't really enjoying that that much. And I always wanted to have like a shop, like a beautiful kind of a nice shop. And it's taken me 10 years to get the shop to way, to look the way it looks now, because I don't want to go into debt either. Um, I think that, so I'm 53 years old and my, my mindset changed probably around your the age that you are now, Jesse. What are you like, 35? 38. Just turned 30. So what happens, I think, when you're in your early 30s, you're sort of in maybe 20s, you're in a collecting mode. And then you kind of realize that life isn't as long as you think it's going to be. And you don't want so many things that take up time. And everything you own takes up time and space. And... Um, so yeah, this is like my shop is a small shop. You see a lot of these YouTubers are getting gigantic shops now and great, but that's just not who I am. I like to have everything kind of a small, tight little shop, work on one project at a time. And the only way I would expand is if I end up doing something with my sons and they want to do something. And it's only mm -hmm. if they want to do it. They, my feeling is if they say, hey, I want to get into CNC and I want to get into plasma cutting or whatever, I'll be like, okay, if we can do it together somehow and I can help you, great. But that's not what I want to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, like I'm I just don't want to depend on a computer, but if like my son Walter's kind of a tech kind of a guy, I could see the use for CNC, but I don't want to learn a CNC. Yeah. So that's kind of a long roundabout question to have I always been that organized? No, I'm finally getting there, I guess. Yeah. Uh, work in progress here. Yeah. Jesse, it's weird to see you on camera without your ear protection and searching for a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more, throw that one in there, yeah. yeah <laughs> more cameraman. Uh, let's see here. Ryan's got a question there. He's saying, should I focus my company on, on more furniture or for the sake of making more profit, move more into general carpentry? Uh, I would say, like, if you're not established, as a furniture maker, you're probably going to have a harder time making a buck building furniture than you would say doing renovations or working as a general contractor. So, uh, I don't know how you started out 
you know, in your career, John, but I started out just as a, a, a guy on the goon spoon digging holes on construction sites. And then I, you know, worked into framing and hated framing and, and form work and then decided to go into finishing carpentry. So it's like my, my background is in general, you know, construction. And then, you know, I always had a love for the furniture and finder, finer woodworking. So that's why I have specialized into finishing carpentry, which I've, I've, you know, was a good way to make a living um, when I was doing it. And then, you know, started the whole YouTube thing because I really wanted to build furniture and stuff like that. And, and that was the only kind of avenue that I saw being able to make a go of that um, just because there's very little market for custom furniture where I live um, with all the big box stores and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I, I would say, you know, get established doing some renovation work and, and working as a, as a carpenter in the trades and then, you know, start to acquire tools and maybe, you know, be able to buy a property that has a barn or a garage that you can convert into a wood shop. And then you kind of slowly transition, you know, and, and maybe, you know, working as an influencer might be in the cards because it seems like a lot of people are doing it and they're, I don't know if the demand is waning, you know, there's obviously so only so much, so many people that are interested in, in watching and learning woodworking online. But there seems to be a lot of people doing it and a lot of people making a living at it. And, you know, when John and I were, you know, starting our channels, there weren't a lot of big name makers out there. Um, but now there's tons of channels. I can't even keep up with all of them. And they all seem to be making a living and they all seem to be you know, living their dreams. So don't, you know, don't shelf any of your dreams, but come up with a really a realistic kind of plan as to how you're going to go about it. And don't don't think it's going to take you two or three years. It's going to take 10 years. <laughs> I, I I agree with that, and I do think it's like the Finnish carpentry kind of built-in thing. And I interviewed my boss. I started in the like 1985 at a place called the Woodworker, and when I was working with him, we built a lot of custom furniture, working with designers and things like that. And when I went back about three years ago, when he retired and sold his his uh, building, he said uh, it all changed. Um, Probably in the early 90s, it just all went to built-ins and kitchen cabinets because of all the, you know, very rarely would he make a standalone piece of furniture. It all just went into uh, kitchen cabinets, built-ins. And, and, and the funny thing is, I say entertainment centers, but not when I was working with them, we would make entertainment centers that were like three feet deep because of the, to, <laughs> to hold the yeah. TVs, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, original furniture so i it's hard to get the number to make it it's hard to get the number to make it worth your while to build a to build a piece of original furniture yeah you know if you can get that client that's great so my clients are are kind of coming over from spending a lot of money on artwork so they're they know like it's an it's a one of a kind it's not going to be the same price as something that you get from ikea yeah exactly John, uh, are you going to be putting that assembly table up, like a uh, video up on that? <laughs> oh, yeah, I am. I thought I was getting teased here. Like, when are you going to no. do it? Because I've, I've been talking about doing that now for about six months. Oh, maybe <laughs> yeah, it is will... teasing you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I will, uh, I will get that video done because that's going to be like the last big thing to my shop. And then, then it's just about making furniture and, and kind of taking my time with it and not – you know, I think when we all started, you know, like going back, you know, years with uh, with you and, uh, you know, with you, Jesse, and all the, I don't know, just, I can't think of anybody right now, but it was like this race to produce a show like every week. Yeah. And now I'm like, whatever, if I can get it, if I can get a, a project done in three weeks, great. If it takes me five weeks, great. If I have something to talk about in between, then I'll talk about that in between. And maybe mm -hmm. sometimes a quick project comes up that only does take a week, but to build like a, a piece of furniture that you want to have to be able to last a lifetime, you can't really make that in a week and shoot a video and edit it and, yeah. you know, <laughs> and it's, sleep. It's, Been there, yeah. done that, lost my mind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John, would you care to care or, or comment about the LED cured finishes? I just saw that sure. video that you, you you put up earlier today, right? Yeah. So so what I like so like that's a that's a kind of some of the content that I like to make. 
I really like editing video when I'm not on the video <laughs> and uh, I don't mind doing my own videos, but I love going out and meeting people and, and shooting them and then kind of editing it down. Anyway, those are my friends over at Green Street Joinery. They're a professional cabinet shop here in New Jersey and vesting finishes out of, um, I forget, I think it's a Danish company. Anyway, they have a, uh, an oil wax finish similar to Rubio Monaco. And they also make another product that cures with an LED light. Not a, it's not a UV light. A few people said in the comments, I think you mean UV light, but right on the can, it says LED hard wax oil. Anyway, uh, I think it's impressive because he put on two coats in a matter of minutes while I was just, you know, hanging out shooting the video did a little scuff sand in between each coat. And um, when I got back to the shop, I took a water, poured some of the water on the piece of sapili, put my cup down, left the shop, came in the next morning, wiped the water away, and there was no ring. And so really? for me, that's like a win. So the LED light is actually, like I didn't actually watch the video, I just saw you posted it. That, that LED light is curing it in how fast? Immediately. Like seconds, yeah. Just immediately like, you just go up and down and it's done yeah wow. yeah so when we were at makers camp so that's that was jeff at, from green street joinery uh he uh, another guy was there with a project i think his name is bliss carpentry uh he had a tabletop and jeff did just one coat and the guy poured some beer on it and it just beaded right up and so you kind of would expect that but the kind of eight or nine hour putting the cup of water on it and then, you know, it not being there the next day, uh, that's that's a pretty impressive finish. And it's very quick. So it's the same thing where, you know, you put the one coat on, you're going to get some of those little nibs or whatever. And then you'd sand it with 320, put another coat on, maybe sand it again with 320, put that last coat on and don't do anything. Or you could hand rub the finish, I'm sure. Like, like I usually hand rub all my finishes with a product called wool lube, which is like a, it's a buffing paste. It's basically a lubricant. So the steel wool doesn't burn the finish. Hmm. It gives you that nice feel, you know, when you touch a piece of furniture. Yeah. Um, let's see here. I've got, oh, here's one. Uh, this is good. <laughs> Settle the debate. Milwaukee, DeWalt or Makita. I don't think they're really settling this debate. <laughs> it's like the ongoing debate. Well, what's your perspective, Jesse? Uh, I'm I'm kind of on the on the fence in some regards. Uh, I used to be a sold out Makita guy, and I still am. Um, but I would say that there are other companies out there. Dewalt and Milwaukee actually make uh, better batteries. Um, Makita's just launched a 40 volt lineup, which isn't really even available in Canada yet. There's like maybe like a drill and a circular saw that you can get um, your hands on. So I haven't tested any of that stuff out. I would be interested to see what their new lineup, you know, with the power and the longevity is, whether or not, I'm sure it's a contender with maybe the Milwaukee stuff and the DeWalt stuff as well. But um, I like Makita because their tools are more um, geared towards woodworkers. I find like the routers have smoother bearings and uh, their motors, just the, the accuracy and just like the ergonomics of their tools uh, really just go well with me and what the way I like to woodwork. Um, whereas I find like DeWalt and Milwaukee are a little bit more like basic, you know, like construction grade, whereas Mil Makita's like, furniture maker, you know, fine carpentry grade tools. Um, but then, you know, their, their batteries are getting pretty outdated and don't really have the same, um, lifespan and, and power as, you know, the Milwaukee lineups and the DeWalt lineups. And, and, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I haven't tried out their new 40 volt stuff. Maybe it's a game changer. Um, but I, I still like Makita just for this, the smoothness and the, you know, quality of their construction and engineering. Um, but you know, I know a, a lot of tradesmen and they all swear by Milwaukee as far as like, you know, drilling holes for electrical and plumbing and stuff like that. They're, you know, they burn through Makita drills way too fast and the Milwaukee stuff can actually hold up to the, to the abuse. And so 
Um, yeah, I'd be interested to try out the new Makita stuff. I'm sure I, I don't think I'm going to switch brands just yet, but, you know, I am kind of like Makita seems to be kind of falling behind uh, as far as innovation is concerned uh, with battery technology. And so I'm kind of bummed about that, but I'm still kind of sticking with them just because I got so many tools, right? So what about you, John? I, I didn't realize that Makita was falling behind with battery. And I was actually thinking about getting my son's three uh, Makita combo kits for Christmas this year. And the reason why I was thinking of Makita is because I like the fact that I like the Makita track saw, the cordless one. Yeah. And I like the fact that they have a cordless biscuit joiner. And so I think anytime you're thinking about cordless tools, it's really the platform. So like what platform do you want to get on? And I'm on the I'm on the Milwaukee platform and I like it, but um, they don't have a uh, they don't have a track saw and they don't have a they don't have a cordless biscuit joiner. And and do they have a like Jesse has a small laminate tr trimmer router as well? They do. Cordless. That's nice. I, I lo like I'd like to have I'd like to have like three or four of those and not change the bit. And yeah. um, so it's. I didn't realize that Mil Makita was falling behind in the battery. That's now, now I'm thinking Milwaukee. Now you got me thinking Milwaukee. Yeah. Like they, they, Makita's kicking kicks, butt still in the fact that they have so many tools, like yeah. so many cordless tools. I think it's like, I think it's like 240 tools or something like that, that run off the 18 volt batteries. Like there's everything you can imagine. Um, and so that part of Makita, like I really love, uh, where it's like DeWalt and Milwaukee, like they're, you know, they stick to the drills and saws and the kind of like the most commonly used tools, whereas Makita just has a very diverse, diverse lineup. Um, you can get six amp hour batteries for Makita and they, 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 they run like they work well. Um, but like, you know, Milwaukee's making like nine amp hour and 12 amp, you know, they're these big kind of beastly batteries, but it is nice to not have to, you know, switch out your batteries all the time. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, the, you know, the Makita 40 volt might be like awesome game changer stuff. And I know like I've, I saw some people in the UK and, and they actually have a 10 and a quarter inch timber beam saw with a 40 volt battery. And I was like, that is amazing because my 10 and a quarter inch, you know, corded Makita saw is like one of my favorite saws. Like I love that thing. It cuts so smooth. It's such a versatile tool. Um, for doing timber framing. And I was like, to have a cordless version would be insane. So, you know, I'm, I'm not holding my breath, but I am looking forward to that new Makita 40 volt lineup whenever it's kind of available here. And I don't know how many tools they have built for that lineup. I'm sure they're just starting with the basics. You know, I know they have like a full size circular saw or even an eight and a quarter circular saw. Um, and I saw that at the store and it looked, it looked really nice, like Makita quality built and everything. And so I was like, I'm, I'm excited for that, but you know, I'm kind of eh, Makita, and, and I don't have a, the best history. <laughs> yeah, they should be paying you. That's why. Know. That's why some of them turned out black. And so they, you know, they they're they're marketing, and they're. I find that Makita's biggest issue is like it seems like they're trying to get their products to market on a horse and wagon. Like they're just they. The stuff you, it's like when usually like when Devolt or somebody like launches a new lineup, it's like as soon as you hear about it or watch a YouTube video, it's like you go to the store and the whole thing is there. It's like the whole lineup, all the tools, you can buy them. It's like Makita, it's like they launch a new lineup and then you're like, oh, that's amazing. And you go to the store and they're like, yeah, we won't be getting that for two years. And it's just like, what? Like, where's your production? Where's your like infrastructure to get these products to the market so your consumers can use them? And you know, I've talked with reps and stuff where I live, and maybe it's just where I live, um, being, you know, on Vancouver Island and not being like a super, you know, big hub city or something. But it's like getting a hold of these stuff out here is an actual pain, you know, and they got to order it in. I'm just like, man, like, why don't you just have product? Like, why don't you just stock this stuff? And so I, I just run into issues just with that, like their customer service, they're getting the products to market. And just kind of you know falling behind in their batteries, but so we'll we'll see if if I'm hoping that the new lineup you know more tools start coming in and I can actually start maybe buying some of them or something. But they're probably also really expensive, and so I'm like, crap, I don't have money to switch to a whole new system and throw away like 15 different batteries. And you know I've got like seven, probably I don't know 40 or so cordless Makita tools, right? And I'm just like, I'm not just gonna throw them away or 
selling on things, but I'm gonna have to like invest thousands in a new system. So yeah, it's I'm kind of on the fence as to where where to go right now because hmm. a lot of my batteries are getting they're done. Right, I need to either replace them or you know whatever. So and you can't buy a battery. I could never bring myself just to buy a battery. So expensive. I, I would just buy a tool that comes with two batteries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a here's a good comment here. Hi, John. Hey, Chuck. Just thanks for right. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh didn't mean chuck, to put that uh, chuck just built a nice shop oh yeah yeah uh we got what else we got here oh yeah i wanted to hear for jesse about your uh hot tub um <laughs> just finished the hot tub tutorials uh videos on makers mob uh how's it holding up after you scaled uh it it's holding up really well. Um, you know, it's kind of gone gray on the outside. I put some like linseed, boiled linseed oil on it or whatever, and that's kind of you know washed off or whatever. I'm just letting it kind of go gray on the outside. But um, no, it's it's beautiful. I use that thing like almost every night. It's it's by far the the best project I ever built as far as like return on investment. <laughs> um, you know, it cost me about five grand to build it with all the you know components and computer it was made like the wood was 1500 or so for the clear cedar probably more now but um you know most of the money was spent like on the hot tub cover and all the mechanical you know computers and heaters and that sort of stuff um but uh, my, my wife and i are in that thing uh, almost every night and uh yeah i just absolutely love it um there you know i've noticed there's a you got to kind of monitor the chemicals a little bit more um, and you get a fair bit of wood pulp in the filter that you got to clean out. Um, but other than that, it's just a, a dream. Um, I put, you know, I had some issues when I installed and I left a, a gap and thinking the floor was going to expand and all that kind of nightmare that I show in the tutorials. Um, but I got it watertight and I actually even put a, a bead of marine grade sealant along the, you know, where the staves attached to the floor. I, I sealed all the way around the inside. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was actually going to do anything. And then I noticed like, you know, it's been what, three, four years now. Um, but I noticed some of the caulking was kind of like getting a little bit loose. And so I like grabbed it and kind of peeled off a section of it thinking like, ah, it's probably not even doing anything. Right. Like the wood, the water's kind of swelled the wood and that's what's keeping it watertight. But then now it's actually got a slow leak kind of right where I peeled off some of that caulking. <laughs> it's like dripping and slowly, you know, the water level goes down over a period of a couple of weeks. So, I'm thinking when I drain the hot tub the next time, I'm gonna take my heat gun out and try and dry that area and peel off all that caulking and then maybe put a new bead of like Sikaflex um, around there to see if that will s stop the leak. Or I might even take some like small wood shims and kind of just see if I can, you know, tap in some thin pieces of wood and, and then that'll swell and close the leak. But up until this point, until I peeled off some of that little bit of caulking, it didn't leak or anything. Like it's been holding water well and, and uh, you know, you pay extra power to, you know, heat a hot tub year round, but it's uh, been more than worth it having that, you know, at the end of the day or first thing in the morning on the weekend, you go out and watch the sunrise and sit in the hot tub. And, you know, when the snow comes, it's even more magical. So I highly, yeah, like if you're game on to do a project like that, I say go for it because it's, yeah, it's worth it. Awesome. I, I think we're going to, you guys, I think we're going to wrap this this up pretty quick here. Maybe we'll take one more question. If you have another question, put it in the chat. Um, but before we do that, John, do you have anything that you kind of want to add to anything? Or no, nah, just looking no. forward to the next episode of uh, <laughs> of Jesse's channel here. That we're really enjoying. I'm watching. I watched a few episodes with my son Michael. Uh, he he just loved it. He loved the whole you know the adventure out to the lake and. It's um, it's funny because when I bought my house in Vermont, I renovated it. It was that's another reason why the idea of not having a lot of stuff. I bought a house, and it came with the contents in it. And when I went went in there, I was like, "Wow, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, that's a cool thing." And then like three weeks later, it's like I need a dumpster to get rid of all this stuff, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And so, so anyway, um, I ended up ripping the kit, you know, the kitchen out, the bathroom out, and I lived up there like it was a camp while I was renovating it. And I would, I very similar. It was a not as far as a drive. I mean, my drive was not as far as yours is. I mean, yours is a further, yours is a, a shorter drive than mine. Yours is like three hours. Yeah, with the boat trip, it's a two and a half hour drive, and then about a half hour like trailer putting the boat in the water and 
10 minute boat ride and you're at the property kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, mine was like a six hour drive. So I would go up on like five o'clock on a Monday morning, come home Friday night and just live there and do the construction, set up a wood shop in the living room, built the kitchen, the whole thing. But my kids were about your age when I was doing that. And then they would come up, the family would come up sometimes. And, um, but uh, I forget where I was going with that. Oh, anyway, the idea of what happens is that's like a moment in time. You guys will, you'll always remember this. And the great thing for you is you have it documented. Mm -hmm. It because is I was, crazy. I was doing all of this around 2006. And so I got a couple of, you know, stills here and there, but there was really no YouTube and it was just starting. Yeah. And for you to have, and the other cool thing is you, not only do you have the, you have everything documented that you've shared with everybody on YouTube, but I'm sure you've got so much more that doesn't even make it to the final video yeah. mm -hmm. that 10 years from now, you're going to be like, wow, look at that. Yeah. Cause that's what I was looking at. I was looking at you with the, your boys and your wife. And I was like, wow, that is such a cool experience because you really do mark your life. I do at least with projects. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like time just flies by, but if you, if you make projects, it's like, oh yeah, you remember where you were when that was happening. And that's like a monumental project you're working on right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's crazy because like, um, when you're a content maker, like we are a creator, it's like, you're so forward focused that you're just like, okay, what's the next project? How am I going to get this done? How am I going to make manifest this thing into reality? And you know, you're constantly like going, going, and then every like, it only happens maybe like once a year or once every two years. I'm just sitting on my computer and, you know, I, I'm scrolling through videos or looking at analytics or whatever. And I'm just like, Oh man, yeah. Like I haven't, let's watch this video. Or I'll just click on one of my older videos from like way back. And like, I'll just sit there and laugh or I'll see my kids in the video. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like there are these little babies back then. Right. And it's just like, it's trippy. It's like watching old home videos, but it's like, it's just my YouTube channel. It is that in a way it's like a catalog of my life. And I just, I kind of view it as like, oh, this is just my woodworking. This is my job. But it's like, no, my family's been on this journey with me. And then all the kids are in the shop and a lot of videos. And, and you see them, them running around as little babies. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Like, that was, that seemed like yesterday. But, man, that was like years ago. And the kids were, have grown so much. And so it is kind of cool to have that and, and to know that, you know, that as long as the Internet's around, it'll probably always be there, right, that that catalog of the, of the whole journey experience. So no, it, it is really exciting to see that kind of moving forward. And, and I'm looking forward to the time when my boys are, you like, you're saying have hit puberty and got some hair on their balls and can actually do some stuff. You know? <laughs> the funny thing is <laughs> so that I was just like, man, I got, you know, four sons, three of which are, are able bodied. And I'm like, man, I'm going to get my money's worth out of those boys. <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you what, it'll be here before you know it. That's, that's for sure. I mean, Good. They, get big before, they get big before you know it. And, um, but they are, the great thing is having them help. Cause all of my kids helped with like projects, whatever we we're doing, stacking lumber, moving dirt, whatever. They're all like, they're all like able to do stuff. So they'll go like they're at college. And if they need to build something like my, my youngest guy just built his bed. My uh, oldest guy or my oldest guy lives on his own now, but he, he builds things. But they always will say how um, a lot of the guys that they're around don't know the first thing to do. They don't like don't know how to tackle a project. Yeah. That's the main thing. Don't know how to tackle a project. And I mean, and it can be something just as simple as moving a pile of dirt because that just, you know, to be able to take 10 yards of dirt and to have a young person to see like, yeah, if you put your mind to it, that thing can get moved and is gone and, and that job got done. It, it helps them to break down other things in life, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and be able to like deal with, with whatever comes along. And I'm hoping that uh, them watching me their entire life growing up, like they'll kind of have like that, just the base knowledge or at least work well with me. Like, you know, I, when I started working with my dad, you know, like I was a good worker because I'd grown up watching my dad work and so i knew how to anticipate and and help him you know and be a, an asset i'll just be like hey, boo, twiddling my thumbs tell me what to do kind of thing like i i could see the vision right because i'd watched my dad sure. do so many jobs and so many projects around the house that it was just like oh okay I just, 
I need to move this. And, and so it's like, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that in my boys and hoping that they have, you know, some, some desire to, you know, want to learn because I haven't pushed it on them at all up until this point, you know? And, and so I am excited because to think like, you know, I, I joke with the boys. I'm like, you know, what, once I get sick of this, you know, build, and once I'm done building all this stuff, boys, I'm like, I'm hanging up my tools. I'm going to enjoy this for the rest of my life. And I'll still, you know, tinker and stuff. But I was like, you guys are going to take over the channel and we'll become the sons of the samurai channel. Right. And then they can, you know, make the videos and build stuff and, and develop their skills. And it'll just be a continuation of the, the journey. You know, who knows if that'll actually happen, but you know, that, that is kind of like a dream of mine where I'm just like, man, like I don't, I don't, despite, you know, my antics on the camera, I don't actually enjoy you know, being front and center and, and, and I, I just enjoy the process. And so I enjoy sharing it. And I know that it benefits people. And that's why I do it. I'm not, I, I really don't enjoy the fame or the, the celebrity stuff. It's so overrated. Um, you know, the only benefit is that, you know, having influence, uh, helps you financially and, and cool. sponsors come and, you know, fund your projects and, and allow you to do this stuff without taking on a ton of debt. I would say like, that's the biggest benefit of having, you know, celebrity status or whatever in the woodworking field, um, is that, you know, financially you have all these people backing you and helping you get projects done. So it makes you more efficient in that, in that sense. But I would say like the fame doesn't really have a whole lot of value beyond that you know mainly just maybe the connections and relationships that i've been able to make with other makers and and, and people that are fans of the channel that have come to classes and, and stuff like that so it's enriched my life in that way but you know as far as like being cool status or whatever on youtube i i could care less right and so you know it's seeing my sons grow up and and they're already starting to act like hams in front of the camera you know, I, I'm just like, oh, God, what have I taught them, you know? <laughs> like, you know, because they're just looking at the camera and running their mouth off. I'm just like, oh, man, I can't really fault them for that because that's what I do. And and I was like, you know, am I creating these little narcissists that are, you know, like, <laughs> you know obsessed with, you know, videos their whole life? So we'll, we'll see. But but that's the world we live in now. Yeah, yeah it is. So, I'll say one more thing. Like, my, everybody would always ask, uh, are your sons into woodworking? Do you think your sons will do this? And up until, you know, a couple of years ago, they didn't really express any interest. And I think when my oldest went to college, then he started just because he wanted to do things in his, in the place he was renting. And same thing. They've all sort of, you know, they all know how to use. The only thing that I've never let them use is a table saw. I wouldn't let them use my table saw. And now, now that I use a saw stop for the main saw, I, the only one who's used it so far is my middle son. But other than that, uh, they've all known how to use a drill, and but they've never really expressed a huge interest. And I know a lot of fathers are like, man, my, my son doesn't have any interest in woodworking at all. And my kids didn't really either until they become more like young men instead of, unless they're building like a, a bicycle ramp, stuff yeah. like that. That's yeah. how they do it. They yeah. were like, oh yeah, I'll get the impact driver and I'll get some screws and I know where they are and I'll, that's when they would do things like that. Yeah. I started building forts, honestly, like, you know, I didn't, I, I hated construction. I didn't want to do it when I got out of high school. But when I was a kid, when I was a teenager and I was playing in the woods behind my, my house, um, I, that's when the kind of the maker thing started in me. Cause I, we would build forts and, you know, steal lumber from dad's pile and go over, haul it in the bush and, create, you know, tree forts and stuff like that. And, and I did well in woodworking in school. I, I liked working with my hands, but I hated the construction industry. So yeah, it is interesting to see like how, how kids develop and, and whether or not they, you know, take to it. I know like, um, all three of my, my able-bodied boys are, are definitely like very creative and very hands-on like skilled. It's just a question of, you know, do they want to apply that to woodworking? So, mm -hmm. and the discipline, I think that's the thing with woodworking. It's, Woodworking is really a delayed gratification and having the, dis the discipline to get there. Yeah. That's, Patience. That's for me. Patience, Patience and discipline. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, guys, I think, I mean, we've been going for almost hour 15 minutes. So let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Uh, if you guys haven't checked out John Peter's channel, uh, if you're watching on Jesse's, make sure you guys go check it out. Um, He's got a, a recent project he did was his modern sofa table, which we talked about a little earlier, which is an awesome build. Go check that out. Um, 
And if you are uh, if you're a Samurai Carpenter fan, I'm gonna release uh, the next video right now. I'm, click, yeah. I'm, I'm clicking the button. All the all the guys that want to get in line to be the first comment. Yeah. <laughs> Do you Ready? get that on your videos, John, where someone says first? Sometimes, yeah. yeah it's like there's yeah. always somebody that's like first. And it's it like, doesn't bother me. Some people get it annoyed by me that. Either, yeah. but I'm just like, what? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. There's, then, there's, you could, then you could just pin somebody else's comment and it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, Jesse, your uh, latest video for Samurai Carpenter is now live. So, go watch that. Check out John's channel. If you want to learn from either these guys or the other makers on the Makers Mob, click the link in the description below. Other than that, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you guys. Yeah. Good to chat, John. Hey, pleasure talking with you. And let's yeah. get these borders open and come on out this summer and, and uh, enjoy the lake with me. Yeah, yeah. that sounds cool. Awesome. A little collab project. That'd be fun. We can make it happen. For sure. We'll for figure sure. something out. All right. All right guys. Time, everyone. Time See you guys right. later. Be good, guys. See ya. See ya.